All right, so I'm excited to start uh, this class because it is going to be the first time we've taught using the fifth edition of this book, Computer Systems. And uh, now I need to say something about this book. I wrote it and you have to take you have to buy it to take this class. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's not very, um, it wouldn't be very ethical for me to profit by requiring you to, to do the book. So here's the deal. If you would like, this is an option, if you would like, and if you buy the book new, I don't get any royalties for used sales, sorry. But if you buy the book new in either hard copy or electronic format, just bring me the receipt and I will gladly refund you 15% of the retail price, okay? So anyway, that's open to you if you'd like to take advantage of that. Uh, yeah, question? There's not like a code or something. No. There's like, you buying a used book is okay. Buying a used book is fine. It just was published this year. Uh, the pub pub publication date is 1917. But um, yeah, no, there's nothing to be unlocked. Every, all the code, all, in fact, we're gonna use some software, a uh, pretty um, extensive piece of software that goes with the book, but it's all open source and online. Yeah, good question. Okay, any, mo any more, any other questions? So the course, uh, as all the other courses that we teach here, the, we have a course webpage, it's C-O-S-C, is it C-O-S-C or is it C-S? C-O-S-C 330. Okay, so just change your, just bookmark that. And, the, and also all of the, the syllabus is there, the, all of the assignments are there uh, for the whole year. They've all, it's all been uh, predetermined what the assignments are and when the due dates are. There will be two exams and a final. I would like to say, now let, let me say a word before we actually delve into this whole thing. Let me say a word about the topic. So the title of the course and the book is Computer Systems. And it's kind of like there's an analogy to like an automobile. So if you, you know, when you go and buy a car, is all you have to know to use the car is how to start it, step on the gas, turn the steering wheel, right? The user, as a user of a car, you don't need to know anything about how it works under the hood, right? Similarly with computers, if you're a computer user, you just use it at one particular level of abstraction. Now here's the thing, because we are computer science, computer scientists and software developers, the thing of it is is that we write programs for other people to use. But the programs that we write are at a particular level of abstraction. So all of you, I know all of you and you've all programmed. <laughs> in different programming languages. Some of you have programmed in Python, some in JavaScript. I know a lot of you have programmed, probably all of you have programmed in C++. Those programming languages are at one level of abstraction. A high, we're gonna call that level six. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Those, those programs that we write are all at level six. But now what happens, what happens when you write a program? What do you, what do you have to do before you can run it? You have to compile it. And so what does compiling do? Yeah, good, good question. Well, that's what we're going to, that's a huge topic. So the, what it does is it translates to a, to a lower level of abstraction and then that executes at the machine level. So the purpose of this course is to understand what goes on under the hood of the car. Right? What happens when you translate? What is a machine? What is machine language? What are those languages that happen? How does the compiler translate? So it's going down, it's, it's learning what goes on under the hood at the binary level. We're going to learn binary. Okay? We're gonna, in fact, we're going to learn that today. That's today's topic. All right? So we're going to learn how all that stuff works under the hood. Okay, so that's the, t and now here's the thing, and we're going to learn different programming languages at these lower levels of abstraction. Now, even if you don't have to program at these lower levels of abstraction, you know, much, most people don't program in assembly language anymore, but some people do, and 
It's important though that even if you don't program at those low, lower levels of, of abstraction, <clears throat> that you understand what happens at those lower levels of abstraction because if you can understand what goes on under the hood, that helps you to be a better programmer at the higher level. Do you see what I'm saying? There are understanding what goes on under the hood is important to know so that you can be an effective software developer even though you might not ever actually have to program in assembly language. But it, it's, you need to know what goes on at those, we need to know what goes on at those lower levels of abstraction. So that's the purpose of the course, to go down to lower levels to, of abstraction in a computer system and see how all that compiler and translator and execution, all that stuff works at the binary level. All right? Any questions about, about any of this? All the slides are, are available are available online on the um, you know on our course webpage. Okay, so the topic for the first chapter is computer systems. Now, there are a few things, and I'll point them out as we go along, that are so important that you must memorize them. And so there's going to be a number of these today. And the first thing that you have to un that you that you need to memorize is this these seven levels of abstraction. Name them off here. The top level is the application level. The second one is high order language level. The next one is the assembly level. The next one is the operating system level. The next one is the instruction set architecture level. The next one is the micro code level, and the bottom level is the logic gate level. All right? So there's seven levels of abstraction. We need to know what they are and what their, their names are and where they fit in order from top to bottom. All right? So this is how all computer systems are organized, how they are, they are, they are all set up with these seven levels of abstraction. Now, what is abstraction? <clears throat> hiding detail. Abstraction is hiding detail. Suppression of detail to, to show the essence of the matter. Okay, and there are many ways to... Uh, abstraction happens all over, all over the universe. Uh, you know, uh, another way that... Another place that abstraction comes up is in an outline structure. What does your English teacher always tell you to do before you write a paper? Start with the what? Outline, right? And then fill in the details. So an outline structure. Division of responsibility through a chain of command. So this also has to do with reporting structures in organizations. So the president, or the CEO, is at the highest level of abstraction and there's a chain of command that goes down from there. And then another uh, um, manifestation of abstraction is the subdivision of a system into smaller subsystems. Okay, now in figure 1.1, we have three different ways to show abstraction diagrammatically, all right? In part A of the figure, we is, that's called a level diagram. And with the level diagram, you have a box, boxes. In fact, of these three figures, a level diagram, a nesting diagram, and a hierarchy or tree diagram, which one did we just look at? That was a level diagram. Are you with me? That was, that was, here, this figure, right here? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that is an example of a level diagram. A nesting diagram has a box within a box, and the interesting thing about a nesting diagram is that those boxes, the borders of the boxes never intersect. They are wholly contained. They are nested. Are you with me? Okay, so that's another way to represent abstraction. And a third way is called a hierarchy or tree diagram. And um, with the hierarchy or tree, tree diagram, that is applicable in, when you describe abstraction as a chain of command. Like the CEO is at the top, and then the vice presidents, the two vice presidents in figure C, report to the CEO, and then the managers report to the vice presidents, and so on. All right, so those are three different ways. Now, I have to tell you, this is a personal experience. This next figure, figure uh, 1.2, Henry Matisse. I was at the, these bronze sculptures 
are at the UCLA Sculpture Garden. They are huge. It's like from here to the ceiling. Each one is this huge. And they have them mounted, right, four of them, right next to each other. When I saw that, I thought, whoa, talk about a visual description of abstraction. Because what is abstraction? What was the first part of the description of abstraction? Hot in detail. Now look, if you look, and he did these, Matisse did these in chronological order. In 1909, 1913, 1917, and 1920. And look at how much detail is in the figure this is, these are called, this is his series called Bas Relief. And um, they're brass. They're huge. They're mammoth. They're brass. And look at how much detail is in the figure on the left. And then as you go, as he progressed more and more chronologically, what happened to those details? They all went away until only the essence was left. See? And so they are, um, so if you look at this at a level diagram, you've got the four is at the highest level, and then three, and then two, and then one. In fact, it, this is so, I gotta read this to you. He, Matisse was one of the, was one of the, those artists who knew how to write about what he did. I, here, I gotta read this. Now listen to, listen to, listen to what he said. This is, he wrote this in 1908. Okay, He said, in a picture, every part will be visible and will play the role conferred upon it, be it principal or secondary. All that is not useful in the picture is detrimental. A work of art must be harmonious in its entirety, for superfluous details would, in the mind of the beholder, encroach upon the essential elements. So see... What was essential? What, what is essential for an artist? You know, there's truth in different, different disciplines have different truths, All right? So, truth in art. He was talking about truth in art. What is not essential would be detrimental. So, in going to abstraction, you know, it's get rid of the superfluous detail and show just what is essential. It's a really striking visual uh, application of levels of abstraction. And then here is the United States Constitution. It's, has, it's divided into, so you have the Constitution as a whole. Now what is that, what kind of figure is that on the right hand side of the slide? Nesting. nesting. This one's nesting, right? So the, entire, the outer, outer box is the whole what? Constitution. Constitution. And then each one of the, and then the boxes directly within those are the what? Articles, Articles and then inside those are the sections. Okay, so that's another example. And here in figure 1.5 is the levels of abstraction in an organization. So you got the president of the corporation at the top, and then you got the vice presidents who report to the president. You got this chain of command, right? So what kind of a diagram is this? Yeah, tree or hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And then here is the same thing. Okay, here, this is the same concept, but what kind of a diagram is this? Level diagram, figure 1.6. And here is what you have to memorize, figure 1.7. So the application level, the high order language level, the assembly level, the operating system level, the instruction set architecture level, the microcode level, and the logic gate level. And their numbers. Okay? And we're gonna, we have abbreviations for these, like that top one we'll call app 7. The next one we'll call HOL6. And then the next one we'll call ASMB5. Okay, so we've got abbreviations for them. Okay, but that's what, we're, that's what we will be referring to in this overall levels of abstraction of a computer system. Are we good? All right, so here are some high order HOL6 languages. So C, C++, Python, Java. Oh, actually, let me make a comment here as long as we're talking about programming languages. Every one of these levels has a programming language. All right? Now these languages like C, C++, Python, and Java, all those levels, all those languages are languages at level HOL 6, by which we mean high order language level 6. All right? Those are all HOL 6 languages. In this course, we are going to learn machine language at level 3. Okay, the level three is called Instruction Set Architecture Level, ISA. 
And those instructions are written in machine language. And then we are also going to learn an assembly language at level five, ASMB five. So we're gonna learn those languages, but then here's the previews of coming attraction. Another thing we're gonna do in this course is we're gonna write, you are going to write a big Java program. It is going to be like hundreds of lines of code long, and we'll have different milestones, okay? And you will, and, and basically, and we'll give you, you know, we'll, we'll learn the techniques, the programming techniques that you will need to do to do this big project, and um, we'll do it in Java, okay? So we've got all these languages, you know. <laughs> We, you know, you know how to do C, uh, C and C++ and all those other languages, but the, the, the programming language that we will use for our project is Java. But it will deal with these other languages at these other levels. All right? Now, and another uh, language that we are going to learn in here, although we're not going to use it very much, is C. Now, you guys I know have all programmed in C++, but we're going to study C. And there, you only have to write one program in C. That's going to be in the first assignment. And after that, we'll just study it. We won't program in it. All right? So that's another previews of coming attractions. Okay? So those are the HOL6 languages. Now, some of these figures are going to crop up over and over and over again. And one that's going to crop up over and over again is this figure, figure 1.8. Activities of a computer system. What does a computer system do? What it does is it takes input, it processes it, and it produces output. Now you're familiar with this when you write a program because when you write a program you have input statements and you have processing statements and you have output statements, right? But computers do more things than just, you know, process text. They control automobiles. In an automobile, what would be the input? for the processor that controls the car. Yeah, so you press down on the gas pedal, so that sends a signal. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You press down the gas pedal, that sends a signal to the processor and then it figures out how much gas to, right. So it does the processing from the, so the sensors. So there's a sensor for the gas pedal, sensors for the brake. Uh, you, mechanical sensors that senses how you turn the steering wheel. Okay, all that stuff. Sensors for the air pressure and the tires. Those are all inputs. And then the output are the control signals that control the mechanics to actually do the mechanical response of the engine, of the car. Okay? And so we're going to see this, oh, this idea that all computation is done with input processing and output. We're going to see this over and over again as we go along. And here in figure 1.9 is going to be our conceptual model of how every computer system works. Now check this out you guys. There's three parts to a computer system. Okay? There's the disk, there's the central processing unit, and there's main memory. And these three parts of the computer are all connected by a what? What does it say there? By a system bus. All right? Now, these days, your disk might not be mechanical. In other words, it might not actually be a spinning platter. Could be solid state. But at any rate, even if it's a solid state disk, it is, we still refer to it as a disk, and it is separate from main memory. Are you with me? So even if it's a solid state disk, it's still a disk, all right? And the central processing unit, what, how do you suppose we abbreviate that? CPU. CPU, that's the CPU. These are the CPUs, the central processing unit. And these are all connected by the system bus. Now, the question is, here, if, if we go back to here, this input processing output, Every system has input and every, other, and every system has output. Now, where, are, where is the input and the output in figure 1.9? What does it look like it is? The main memory. It's in the main memory. It's actually wired into the main memory. Do you see what I mean? This concept 
Okay, this concept is called memory mapped memory mapped I.O. Alright? So what happens is in a typical computer system the input sensors are all connected into memory and so the way the computer system gets those those input those inputs whether it's from a keyboard see the key the keyboard could be one thing that's that is input to the system so the keyboard is wired into main memory you see what we're saying and then the output like the the signals that go to the screen to the monitor okay that's also uh, wired into main memory does everybody see so does everybody understand now and we're going to get into the details of how all of this stuff works as we go along all right so we have a few examples now in the next few slides now look in C suppose you have this statement J gets I plus one how in the world does the computer system do this computation J gets I plus one well what happens is in figure 1.10 here we see in part A of the figure I and J are variables and they can have values are you with me so what happens is they are they have values that are stored in the main memory of the computer and so the way the system does J gets I plus one first it brings I over the bus into the CPU do you see what we're saying it brings it into the CPU then what it does is inside the CPU it brings J sorry it brings it adds one to it and then after it adds one to it then what does it do it sends it over the bus in the memory to where what is stored to where J is stored so does everybody see the flow of information there are you with me on this so this is a model of what happens in a computer system when you do a statement like J gets I plus one so you can see right away what language is J gets I plus one does that look familiar what language do you suppose that is yeah C Java what level HOL 6 level HOL 6 but we see what it, that, that doesn't happen in just one step what has to happen the I has to go to the CPU the one has to be added the J so one in statement at level HOL 6 gets translated to what has to get translated to what many statements several statements at a lower level of abstraction now that is a huge concept does everybody see and when you're when you compile a program into assembly language or machine language that's what what, hap what that's what happens one statement at a high level language gets translated to more than one statement at a lower level language is everybody clear on that okay and here's another thing uh, here's another fact what does main memory store here let's go back to figure 1.10 what are I and J? What are they? They're variables, integer type, integer, yeah, they're variables. So that's like data, right? But what else is stored in memory? Not only that is the data stored in memory, but what else do you suppose is stored in memory? Well, what is executing on this data? A what? Operations. What's the list of operations? What's that called? That's a program. Are you with me? The program itself is stored where? Also in main memory. Now that's a huge concept in a computer system. Are you with me on this? So in this picture, what happens is here in figure 1.11, what happens is these instructions that are executing, they are also in main memory. So in figure 1.11 we see what has to happen is to execute an instruction that instruction has to be fetched from main memory into the CPU and then it has to be executed but when it executes it executes data that's also in memory. You see what you see how that how they're mixed in there? Are you with me on this? This is super critical uh, model of a computer system of how it all works. All right? And so here when you receive a character from the keyboard, what, is it, what has to happen in, the, in this computer system? The keyboard is wired into the in, it's wired into memory, so it, it goes from that, that character, you, you press a letter, boom, that letter, in order to process that, the CPU has to take that letter from the memory into the CPU and then process it and then send it back. 
Does everybody see how that works? So that's receiving a character. To, if you send data to an output connection, it goes from the CPU to the output port of the memory. Memory mapped I.O. Figure 1.13. Are we good? Now, occasionally there's another kind of aspect to this for speed, and we're not going, we are not going to actually investigate this in much detail at all. But there is another way for memory to flow in this computer system. It's called direct memory access. The acronym is DMA. So anytime you hear in a computer system, you hear people talking about DMA, they're talking about direct memory access. With direct memory access, what happens is the information can flow between disk and memory and bypass the CPU. Now, why would you want to have that happen? So the CPU can be doing what? Can be doing other processing, yeah. So, it, so without tying up the CPU. So there's also this phenomenon called direct memory access illustrated here in figure 1.14. So here's the definition of software. An algorithm is a set of instructions that when carried out in the proper sequence solves a problem in a finite amount of time. And a program is an algorithm written for execution on a computer. We're going to zip through these. Here's a little algorithm for custard. You want to make some custard tonight? Here's your algorithm. <laughs> it's a, you know, sequence of instructions to be you know executed in order and here are the functions of an operating system operating systems uh, what are the common operating systems that you guys use Android is an operating system what's another one Linux, Linux OS 10 Windows those are all operating systems all those operating systems they do file management they do memory management they do processor management and Files can contain documents, programs, and data. And here in figure 1.16 is an, it, what kind of a diagram is this? Hierarchy. Hierarchy. And this is like a typical file system in a Linux or OS 10 uh, computer. So that slash is the root directory. And each one of those boxes represents a directory that has files in it. And so you've got applications, library, users, users, you might have Mary and Sam, and Mary might have documents, music, and photos, etc. Okay? And then the operating system manages all that stuff. That's what the operating system does. Now, in figure 1.7, 17, the difference between analysis and design. Now, you might be familiar with this. In a homework exercise, sometimes the exercise is to analyze a program. For example, to figure out how long it takes to execute. All right, or to figure out what the output is given the input. So with, a, with analysis, what are you given? You're given the program itself and the input, and you have to figure out the what? The output. So that's what analysis is. What do you suppose design is? I, it's not shown here yet, but what do you suppose design is? What's another kind of exercise? Given the what and the what to write the what? Given the input and the output to do what? Write the, write the program. Yeah, write the program. So that's, that's design. That's the difference between analysis and design. You know what this is like? This is like the difference between literature that you analyze and creative writing where you design. It's the exact same thing. Okay? Which is harder? I think uh, design is harder than analysis, I think. Yeah. Usually. And because, you know, it's harder to write a program than to figure out what a given program does, right? You figure out what a given program does, you just mechanically go through, trace through, and, you know, yeah. Now, all information in a computer system is stored in binary. Okay? What does binary mean? Base two. I mean, binary means two. So all these computers that we have in front of us, they're all electronic. So inside the electronics of the computer system are electrical signals. And these signals are either, the engineers design these signals to be either high or low and nothing in between. Do you see what I mean? So what, so a binary digit is called a what? No, it's a bit. 
Okay, so a binary digit is a bit. Okay? And so what we do on paper or on a screen or whatever, we represent the high values with a 1 and the low values as a 0. But really what happens is in the system they're electronic. They're electronic signals that are engineered to be either high or low and not in between. Are you with me? So a bit is a binary digit. Now here in figure 1.18 we have uh, an example of a principle that tells us how many values can be stored in a sequence of bits. Now, in, and in this example, how many bits are there on that column on the right? There's three bits, right? And so how many possible combinations of three bits are there? It could be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. There's eight of them, right? Okay, so the question is, how many values can be stored by, this, by a sequence of n bits? Well, in this example, there's three bits. Two to the three is what? Eight, and there are eight values, that, possible values that can be stored. Are you with me? Does everybody see how that works? And so, how many values can be stored in a sequence of four bits? Sixteen. Five. 32, 6, 64, etc. Is everybody clear on that? Does everybody see that, that quantitative relationship between how many bits are stored and how many values can be stored by that sequence of bits? Are we good? So a binary digit is a... It's, it's unclear whether it's BI here and T here or B here and IT here. <laughs> Either way works. All right, is everybody clear about that, that quantitative relationship? Now, in computing, we have really, really big quantities and really, really small quantities, so we use scientific notation, right? Now, for really small values, and this particularly applies to units of time, in figure 1.19, we have these, and now I assume, these common, these prefixes in the letters, and I assume you already know this from science, right? You guys all know this? Okay, so 10 to the minus 3 is milli, that's m, 10 to the minus 6 is micro, that's mu, 10 to the minus 9 is nano, that's n, 10 to the minus 12 is pico, that's p. So 1 1,000th, 1 1, what's the next one? 1 1,000th one is 10 to the minus 3, 1, a micro is a millionth, a billionth and a trillionth. Do you know what comes after that? Yeah, a femto, I think. Is it? Is, is it? I, think, I think that's what it is. Okay. And now, you guys, those are for small values that normally apply to time. For large values that apply to information storage, we have, we're going to have to learn a different, two different sets here. First of all, on the decimal side, in part A of figure 1.20, on the decimal side, we have the decimal multiples. So 10 to the 3 is a kilo, that's a thousand. 10 to the 6 is a mega, that's a million. 10 to the 9 is giga. 10 to the 12 is tera. And 10 to the 15 is peta. So you, we need to know these. Another thing to memorize, but I assume you already know these, right, from science. Okay, so does everybody remember these? All right. But now here's the thing, you guys. <laughs> In computing, the base system is going to be base what? Not base 10, but base 2. So it's kind of different whenever you count large quantities in binary. Okay, and the thing that's strange about it is that it's approximately the same as decimal, but not quite. So I don't know if you're familiar with this one or not, but here it is. The second half of this figure are the binary multiples and the binary prefixes and the binary prefix letters. So let, let's think about this for a minute. What is, two, what is the value of 2 to the 10? <laughs> Okay, so 2 to the 1 is what? 2. 2 to the 2 is 4. 
8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Finally there. <laughs> Okay, so everybody knows two to the, so we need to know this. Two to the ten is ten twenty-four. That means two to the twenty is what? Ten twenty-four squared. So it's not quite it's a little bit more than what? A thousand squared, do you see? And two to the thirty is what? Ten twenty-four cubed. So it's not a thousand cubed, it's ten twenty-four cubed. So it's a little bit more. So now I haven't really heard people speak the binary prefix. Kibby byte and mebby byte and gibby byte. I haven't really heard that jargon yet. But for sure, it's becoming prevalent in the literature to distinguish between a K and a KI, and to distinguish between a big M and a big M little I. All right? So does everybody understand what these are? And they, they differ slightly from the decimal values, and here's a little table in figure uh, 1.20 part B of the, t of the figure. The difference is like, you know, at a thousand, the difference is about 2.4 percent. You know, by the time you get up to um, 10 to the 15, it's about 12 percent. But still, it's roughly. You see how it's it's roughly the same. But yeah. You don't really work with like millibyte, or like when you go backwards. Like you know, see, there is no. That's a good question. There is no such thing as a millibyte. Or, sorry, there is no such thing as a millibit, because a bit is a one or a zero. See the signal, yeah, so that's a good question. So we don't have fractions of a, yeah, yeah. Although we have to have a way to store real numbers that do have fractions, but they are stored in binary. Do you see what I mean? We have to have a way to store those values when we're, when we're computing with them. But yeah, but, but yeah, but there's no such thing as a millibit. <laughs> there is such thing as a millibit coin. <laughs> Okay, now there's two mathematical relations that we need to uh, that we need to to know how to work with. The first one, the first one is called the system performance equation. Now let me preface this by making this observation. All computation in a computer system happens in space and time. We live in a space-time universe. We have we exist in three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Right? We're all here. Set up your coordinate system X, Y, Z in the universe. We are here at a particular X, Y, Z at a particular time. Right? In computation, this, this has big implications for computation. What we're talking about here is the time, is the time aspect of that. The question is, how long does it take to execute a given program? And the time to execute a given program is based on this system performance equation. The time per program is how many instructions execute in the program, are you with me, times how many cycles it takes to execute each instruction, times how much time it takes to execute each cycle. Now you guys are all familiar in science about how the units cancel. Do you see how the instructions cancel and the cycles cancel and you get time per program on both sides of the equation? Do you see how that works? All right, so now here's the idea. Let's go back to what are these cycles per instruction? Let's go back to this level diagram. We are talking about a, this particular part of the figure. We're talking about level, we're talking about level five and level three. So system performance equation. Okay, these, these levels are one to one. Okay, so there's a one, for every instruction here, there's one instruction here. So this is one to one. On the other hand, at level MIC2, MIC2 is the microcode level. At level MIC2, what happens is one of these produces many of these. Do you see what we're saying? So I don't know how to illustrate this. So MIC2, one ISA3, ISA3 goes to many, to several, let's say. 
to several MIC2. Do you see what we're saying there? So I want to end by doing an example of how you can show how you can use this system performance equation um, to compute the execution time for a program. And it's all based on, this is an application of levels of abstraction of a computer system. Alright? So here's how it's going to work. Here's, here's how we're going to do an example. Oh, and by the way, this time per cycle, uh, do you guys know uh, when you buy a computer, what's one of the things you look at in the specifications for the CPU? What do they advertise? The, the, they advertise gigahertz. Now what is that gigahertz number? That's how fast, the higher the gigahertz rating, the faster your computer is. That's a measure of speed of the computer. So what is that gigahertz? That's cycles per second. Are you with me? So, th so and that's, that's a frequency, lower, little f. So do you see here on this figure, this little f? That's your gigahertz rating. So 1 over f, if the gigahertz rating is cycles per second, then 1 over the gigahertz is seconds per cycle, in other words, time per cycle. Does everybody see how that? So that's, that's your gigahertz rating when you buy a computer, that's what that is. And what that's telling you, what that gigahertz rating is telling you, that's telling you how many MIC2 instructions execute per second. What is your gigahertz rating? What's typical gigahertz? Well, what is a gigahertz? What is 2 gigahertz? What's a giga? What was giga? That's a nine. Ten to the nine. So that's a, what, a billion? You understand that's two billion of these MIC2 instructions per second. That's how that relates to your, to your computer. So here's example 1.1. Suppose your CPU is rated at 2.5 gigahertz. You execute a program task on your app that requires the execution of 16 million ISA3 instructions. If each ISA3 instruction executes on an average of 3.7 MIC2 instructions, in other words, one to several, are you with me on this? One to several, okay. What is the execution time of the program task? Well, you use the system performance equation. The time per program equals what? By the system performance equation, it's the instructions per program times the, the cycles per instruction times the time per cycle. Is everybody clear? It's all just multiplication. We don't have, we're not doing integrating, we're not doing integrating or summation. <laughs> okay? And so what, how do you plug in those numbers from that data? Substitute the values with t equals 1 over. So what would the, what would the instructions per program, what would that be? Okay, so that's 16 times 10 to the 6. And then the cycles per instruction is what? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, cycles per instruction is about, it's about, see, these MIC2, oh, yeah. The relation between, this is what, there's, a MIC2 is a, instruction is a cycle. Okay, and there's one MIC2 instruction per cycle. That's the definition of a micro instruction. It's a one cycle. Alright? And then 1 divided by 2.5, and so you do the math, and you work it all out. 23.7 milliseconds, so the time is 23.7 times 10 to the minus 3, or about 0.024 seconds. Does everybody see how to do that? Alright. So you have, an, uh, you have an assignment due on Thursday. We'll meet again here tomorrow, and we'll continue this. And you'll have, um, yeah, and this will be one of the exercises that you have to do. All right, good deal. Any questions before we finish up? Yeah, question? Is it one MC2? Two? One MIC2 per cycle. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So you have some stuff to memorize. You'll have some more stuff next time, and we'll see you tomorrow.